what separates the Christian church from all the religions of the world, all the different tribes and languages and people and nations that makes the church one. So that wherever you go in the world, you could attend a Christian church and find these five, seven doctrines, seven doctrines. The thing that unifies the church are seven doctrines. You know, Cracker Barrel. You know what's good about Cracker Barrel? Anywhere you go where there's a Cracker Barrel, you're going to find the same thing. You're going to find the same store, same product, same customer service, same price. And if you like that, don't want a new experience with your money, just hungry, would like to have the same experience of satisfying my hunger at a reasonable price with a good condition, you would stop at Cracker Barrel. For me, I'm a Chick-fil-A guy. And everywhere I go, I check fil a They ought to hire me. <laughs> but I've become an expert in the stores of Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. I like it because it's the same store, same product, same price, same great customer service, clean. I know when I stop at a Chick-fil-A, I'm gonna what I'm gonna get. And I tell you, I've stopped everywhere they are. In every state, I look for them. I stop and check them out. I like them. I'm the same way with Express Oil for the same reason. That's the reason I go to Express Oil, apart from the fact that my son-in-law works for them. I got nothing for all these advertisements I just gave. I want to make sure you know that. That's what the church of Jesus Christ should be in the world. You can walk in that door. I don't care what it is. I don't care what. I don't care if they say I'm Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Wazoo, or whatever. You walk in that Christian church, Paul says, you should find seven doctrines that give us unified unification in Christ. No matter where you go, you ought to be able to find these seven doctrines. Now, Paul was a missionary's missionary. This guy evangelized the Roman Empire around the Mediterranean Sea in his lifetime. And he established churches to be the same, just like Cracker Barrel on Chick-fil-A. Express oil. And he was really content to do it. And so he lays this out in the book of Philippians. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, he lays this out. He said there's seven key doctrines that unify the church. Unify the church universally. Here we are. And I'm going to take these seven doctrines and I'm going to teach them over the next seven weeks. Here's what he says. There is one body, one spirit, as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of us all, who is over all, through all, and in all. And that's all. No, I, I added that. I shouldn't do that, I guess. Did you get those seven? This is the unity of the church. You should be able to go anywhere in the world. And the doctrinal stance, the foundation of that church ought to be these seven doctrines. You come to this church, you're going to find them. You come to this church, you're going to find these seven doctrines. This church is built upon the foundation of these seven doctrines. 
And it used to be that you could go anywhere in the South where there's a doctrinal church. Where if, you, if it was a doctrinal church like we are, you would find these seven. That's not true anymore. It should be, but it's not. Why they've departed from it, I have no idea. But you'll find them here, and so we're going to take these seven doctrines after a word of prayer. We're going to discuss them. The Bible, if it has meaning to your life, it's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type of sins, sins of the tongue type, or overt type. The Holy Spirit's responsibility is to call your mind and bring you to conviction about that sin. And when he does, your responsibility through your priesthood is to confess that sin in privacy to him to get that issue cleared up from carnality to move into spirituality because that's where the dynamics of the Christian life is lived. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. So I'm going to give you a moment to examine your life as Al did with an understanding of 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's your responsibility to get the maximum out of this hour of Bible study. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, not just saved people, spiritual people, people who are under the minist teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit and not just under Ron Adema. Father, we thank you for these that have come our way by automobile and the Internet to visit with us during the next couple of hours. In this hour, I will be teaching on the one body doctrine, the doctrine of the one body that should be in all Christian churches. I'm going to give four major points of the foundation of this doctrine. I pray that our people would understand it and be able to communicate it to others so that the church of Jesus Christ could resume its role of impact in the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're looking. When Paul would go to all these foreign nations, went to Asia Minor, uh, Arche Archaea, uh, out of Corinth and all these places, all the way to Spain, he found that religion had a central message. All religions have a central message. This is how you can separate those of the church. If the church has this central message, it's not a grace church. It's not a foundational church. And that's the message of works. All religions of the world, their key doctrine is works. Works for salvation and works for spirituality, works for worthiness for a relationship with God. The only way you can be worthy of a relationship is to work. You work for your salvation. You work for your spirituality. You work for your spiritual growth. You work for your rewards. Work, work, work. The truth of the matter, that is not the message of the church. The message of the church is grace. Christ did all the work. We do the receiving on the basis of grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift. Not only is your salvation a gift, your Christian life is a gift, and everything about your life is a gift, even unto death. That's why Paul can say, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Your life should be one of gain in life and gain in death. And the only way you'll have that in your life is to become grace-oriented. The message of the Christian church of one body, one spirit, etc. is this message that there's only one Christ. His name is Jesus. He is the Son of God. He is equal in deity with God. That's the book of 1 John, if you're interested. There's none like him. He's the only one like it. He is the head of the church and the savior of the body. 
And the church must believe that and know that. And so we're looking at that. We're looking at what is the difference between the Christian church in Russia and religion. What's the difference in a Christian church and religion? Sometimes there's no difference. They talk Christ, but the talk works. You can't have them. Christ does all the work, therefore you get grace. Grace comes through being spiritual through the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Grace works because you live by faith and not by works. You live by faith and not by... You live by faith, and God responds. Listen, you know why you live by faith? Romans 4.21. I assume that everybody who didn't look at Romans 4.21 knows it. This is the reason you live by faith. Because faith puts you in a position to receive the promises of God knowing that God will do what he's promised. God will do what he's promised. God will do what he's promised. He doesn't give you the promise for you to do the promise. He gives you the promise so that you can trust God to do the promise. There's a difference in that. You, you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of it. Here's Paul's message. Romans, the third chapter, verse 24. Being justified, being justified, being justified from my sin, being justified from my sin, listen to this, as a gift. Justified. Where the, my, the, where my sin is removed and I'm justified to be in a relationship with God and to stand in his presence and to be in his presence because of the work of Jesus Christ, my justification is a gift. I didn't make that up. I just read it. Being justified as a gift by what? By his grace, through the redemption, work of Christ on the cross, burial, and resurrection, which is in Christ Jesus. That's third chapter, verse 24. Write this down on your paper. Go to Romans, the fourth chapter, 4 and 5, and you are told that if it's works, it's wages. It's not a gift. Justification is not by works, it's a gift. That's Romans 3 and 4, by the way. You got to get this idea out of your head. What you got to get in your head that God deals with you on the basis of grace from salvation to Christian life and beyond. You need to know the six stages of grace that affect your life. We teach that here. We teach saving grace, logistical grace. We teach all of that. We believe in that. That's what sets us apart. This is what sets the Christian church apart. This is what Paul taught in all of his churches so that they were of one. The body is what? One. It's made up of a lot of members, but one. One body with one head and one savior of that body. One. One. He used that word one seven times to tell you that these are seven one doctrines that are important to the church. It's what makes us a Cracker Barrel, a Chick-fil-A, a Express Oil. It's what makes it. I, I promise you, people skip that stuff. They don't pay any attention to it. You're not going to hear this. You're not going to hear this. Get it here. Get it here where you can get it here. So I'm going to take a look at this today. 
in the book of Ephesians, Paul shares with us seven key theological doctrines that separate Christianity from the worlds of religion and from churches that uh, teach grace. You know, I'm sad to report to you that there are more churches in Christianity in America and probably across the world that teach works. We're in a minority. Did you know that? They teach grace. Oh, they talk grace, but they don't teach it. They talk it, but don't teach it. They'll talk about grace for salvation and works to keep it. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what Paul's talking about. That's not what Christ, that's not what Christ died for either. He died for you to have the full experience of grace from salvation to eternity. So I'm going to talk about four things tonight. I'm going to talk about four things tonight. The doctrine of one body. What does that mean, one body? Here's the first thing. Jesus Christ in session, that's seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven today. Now, he's not on vacation. He's at work. He's in session. The Congress is now in session. He's in session. Because the work on earth is done, but the work in heaven has just begun. The work on earth is done. He died on the cross for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and ascended back to the Father, and is seated in session. He does the work so we can have it by grace. He does the work today. Not only did he do the work to purchase the church, he does the work for the church, setting in heaven for us to work it by grace. We live it by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves is a gift. You sit around and whine and cry and complain about stuff that grace has given you. Why do you do that? Oh, God, if I had a job, then you complain about it. Oh, God, if I had a love in my life, then you complain about it. Oh, God, if I was married, then you complain about it. Oh, God, if I had children, then you complain about it. Oh, God, and you complain too much. Why do you do that? I'll tell you why. Now, listen to me, because you're not getting it. It's because you're not grace-oriented. Grace orientation, you're thankful for whatever God puts on your plate. You're so thankful for it. You're so thankful for it. Because you didn't deserve it, Christ did everything to give it to you as a gift, and you don't appreciate the gift. Are you married? Your marriage is a gift. You got kids? They're a gift. Your maid is a gift. Your children are a gift. Your job is a gift. Your church is a gift. Your life is a gift. Grace tells you your life is a gift. I mean, who thinks about your health until you don't have it? You should think about it ahead of time and tell them how thankful you are for it. You know why? Listen to me. I don't want to be tough on you today. I don't want to be tough on you. I don't want to be tough on you. You got to become grace oriented. You got to think grace. You got to think about it. You got to think about it. And every time you want to complain about something, say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't be complaining about gift and grace. I need to embrace it. People at work need to see the fact that my life is about Jesus Christ, it's not about this job. My life is about Christ. I'm thankful for this job. I go on this job every day thankful to God that I have a job. Listen, there are no perfect jobs. <laughs> if you're looking for one, there are none. I guess I have it. If there's a perfect job, I've got it. You know why? You know why I think my job is perfect? Because God gave it to me as a gift. And I'm so thankful for that gift. You know, 
many years ago, my buddies I went through seminary with, they'd call me. Want to know how your church is going? Because they're all about stats. How, how's your church doing? God, God released me from that foolishness when he taught me grace. And I would say, we're doing great. How about your attendance? 100%. 100% attendance. How many times do you teach? Well, I, I teach Tuesday, Thursday. I, I teach Tuesday and Wednesday. Back then, I taught all over the place. I told them how, how many days I taught. Then the School of Biblical Theology, how much we taught. Okay. What's your attendance like? I said 100%. And so over the years, <clears throat> they'd come up with stats on me again, and I would tell them something, well, how's your budget doing? 100%. We always have more than we need. Always have more than we need. You gotta, you're always have more than you need. Yeah, how about your membership? We're full. 100%. None of this... You see, for me, none of this is about work. I'm not responsible for that stuff. I'm not responsible for it. So I took a different attitude. I took the attitude of grace. And it's really helped me because when the numbers shrink, it don't bother me. It will bother me when we get down to one car load because I'm going to come to your house. We're all going to drive over to your house and be no sense keeping all this up for six people. But I don't see six except for that reason. My attendance still 100%. Because I believe God sends me positive listen, people who want to learn, people who want to learn, uh, study to improve their life, to fall in love with their perfect life. You know, you do have a perfect life. It's the only kind God gives. Salvation is perfect. Therefore, your life is perfect. You complain too much. You complain way too much. And I don't want to hear this stuff. Well, when you get older, I'm there. I used to see all these old grumpy people. And I would deliberately not sit around them because they just drove me crazy. I'm not, going to be, I'm not going to be one of those old grumpy people. I'm going to set where all the young people are with those grumpy people. <laughs> Jesus is in session, seated at the right hand of God the Father. You know why? Because he's the head and savior of the one body. <laughs> That's why he sits on the biggest seat. That's why he's in absolute authority. He's earned the right by going to the cross in obedience to the Father's will. Not by my will, but thy will be done. That's the way you live in this perfect state of existence with God. Who is all in all, through all. <laughs> Paul said, Paul said, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. <laughs> That's about as good as it gets, doesn't it? I call that perfect. That's pretty good. You know who is, you know who is all in all, through all, for all? You know who that is? God. You know who he is? It's your daddy. It's your father. Father has so much more concern for you. On your worst day, he has the best day for your life. On your worst day, he still has the best day for your life if you'll turn to him. People go, I hear this all the time in the restaurant. Uh, have a good day. What kind of a day are you having? And I hear all kinds of things. Oh, I'm having a terrible day. I don't. I refuse to have one. It's not from God. A bad day is not from God. A good day is from God. So therefore, I take them all as good. I 
I'm talking about me. Yeah, I can't talk about you, and I can't talk about those people in my life. <laughs> I don't want to talk about me because I'm grace-oriented. My whole life's a gift. Every day is a gift. Every minute of that day is a gift. So why wouldn't I accept that? I believe it's true. There is one body. In Ephesians 5.23, Christ is the head of the church, which means his body. Christ is the head of the church, he himself or alone, being the savior of the body. He's the savior of the body, called the church. Acts 20.28. I am reminded to shepherd the church of God, not the church of Ron Adama. Shepherd the church of God, which Christ purchased with his blood. He purchased what? The church, the one body. Bought, purchased, bought, purchased, bought, not stole. Where'd you get that good looking car? I just stole it <laughs> at the gas station. A person got out, I got in. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about purchased. Purchased. Bought. Lock, lock, lock and barrel. Lock, stock and barrel. Savior of the body. He is the head of the church and Savior of the body. As a Savior of the body, we're talking about 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. I'm talking about Romans 1, 16. The gospel, which I just said, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Believes what? Believes the gospel. You're not going to save because you believe that Jesus is a good guy. You're not going to be saved because you're going to be saved because you believe that he, his purpose in the first advent was to go to the cross, die there for our sins, be buried and raised from the dead the third day. Then you understand you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as gift, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. By now, you should know those three verses, shouldn't you? I mean, there's not a day go by in a church that I don't talk about that. You know why? Because people don't, don't believe that anymore. Shepherd the church. Shepherd the sh church of God, which his son purchased with his blood. Revelation 5, 9. Watch this now. You were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Watch this. Here's, world. Here's the world evangelism. With your blood, men, mankind, from every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. Go Matthew 28, 18 through 20. That's exactly what we do. That's exactly what Paul did. And when he got to these tribes, languages, people, and nations, he found religion already there. And he won in those places bold as a lion because they, he knew that they did not know how to be set free. It was for this freedom that Christ set us free. And Paul went to the message of freedom in Christ. And he marched right across the Roman Empire with the gospel of Jesus Christ and established churches to teach the seven foundation doctrines that make them all look like Walmart. Well, I don't like Walmart anyway, anymore. I'm not a Walmart fan, but I am of... <laughs> Chick-fil-A and Express Oil. <laughs> That's just my opinion. It's only worth an opinion. <laughs> I've, been, I've been talking to my son-in-law today about getting some, some money back on this thing, much as I'm pushing it. Look, in Acts, the 16th chapter, everybody quotes this and nobody quotes it right. In Acts, Acts 16, 30 and 31, Paul is in jail for preaching the gospel of Christ, and he's having a revival. <laughs> he's having revival. I mean, people are singing all night long Christian songs. He's teaching them the Christian songs. He's preaching the gospel. People are getting saved in jail. 
The great, you're going to hear people walk out of prison and say, the greatest day of my whole life was being sentenced to jail because I met an evangelist there that changed my life. Good reason to go to detention centers and prisons in Horton. If you want to get set free, don't break, don't break out of jail. Break out into Christ. It sets you free. But the jailer, when the, when, it, when the revival got up hot and heavy, he came to him and he said, what must I do to be saved? Where did he get that idea? Religion doesn't talk that way. Where did he get that? He got it from two guys in prison preaching the gospel and singing Christian songs, and everybody was joyful, and prison had turned into a party, a Christian party. And the jailer, the head guy over it, came to Paul and said, what must I do to be saved? I want that. He was using a term that Paul had established. He said, what must I do? He's talking like a religious person. What must I do? In our culture, we have to do to get saved. What must I do? You know what Paul told him in verse 31? Believe. He said, believe. Took that word do and turned it into believe. And so what has happened in that jail, they were learning a lot of new Christian terms like saved and believe. That's why we preach it here. Never know when it might break out. And you'd actually get happy to be here. Wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be good? Every tribe, every tongue, language, every people of every nation. You know what's interesting? When you go to a foreign nation and you go into a Christian church, if they, got, if they got even half of these foundation doctrines, you feel comfortable. Even if they only have three out of seven. Because you, you feel bonded. Because of continuity. Now, I walk into Chick-fil-A in Christianburg, Virginia when I'm up there. Now, I go every morning to Chick-fil-A. I mean, I... I'll eat dinner with you, but I eat, I eat breakfast with them, you know. And I just feel at home. They're the same people doing the same thing, serving the same food. I go like, I'm home. What a wonderful thing for a guy like me. What a wonderful thing there. That the same attitude. I have great ministry. I have great ministry there with people, both staff and people who come in. It's a different, different group of people, at least in my life. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand, watch this, as a prince and savior to grant repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. I'm making you hungry, ain't I? Two out of the three were food stores. Did you notice that? It just dawned on me. <laughs> None of them were clothing, by the way. Of course, you can tell that. <laughs> the head of the body, Ephesians 1, 19 through 23, well worth your read. But here's Ephesians 1, 20. He raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. Look what's going on earth down here. Ephesians 1, 20 through 22 through 23. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Watch what he gave. Ah, oh, watch what he gave. See, you're going to miss this. Look what he gave. The fullness of Christ who fills all in all. That's the, that's the goal of being part of the one body of Christ. Oh, the fullness. You know what fullness is? Is when you sit at the table You'd like that second piece of pie, but you'd have to unbutton your britches. <laughs> you ever been that place? 
I mean, mama's putting some good food on the table when you want some more, and you go like, now when I go to unbutton it, I go like, well, you're going to have to first John. First John 1, 9 and see if you really want that second piece by it. Well, as soon as I do it, I say, wrap it up, and th I'll take it home. I've learned if I have to undo my pants, I'm about to get in gluttony. <laughs> I'm just saying me. I don't know about you. I'm telling way too many secrets about my life today. <laughs> That's what my wife would tell me. Point number two. She would say, quit doing all that. <laughs> Point number two. At the, here's the second thing about the one body. At the moment of grace salvation, er, at the moment of salvation, every believer becomes a member of the one universal body of Christ. Think about that. Not local body, universal body. The universal church. Become a member of the universal church. People, my friends all the time say, how come you don't have church membership? Because it's already been taken. I've been part of churches that had church membership. It's okay. I, I, it's okay. I don't do it because they, they're already a member of the church. So we, we, we're, our membership is based on attendance, not joining. <laughs> joining means nothing. Today I love you and tomorrow I hate you, I'm gone. Oh, I'm not going to tell you. So you got, all this, you got all of this people who have left the church whose name are on the roll and you can't even find them. You can't take them off the roll. <laughs> you can't find them for consent. <laughs> well, I saved a whole lot of paperwork. I'm not interested in people who are just looking to join so they can have somebody to bury them. I'll bury you. You don't have to join nothing. I'll bury you just for the opportunity to preach the gospel at your funeral. <laughs> Won't charge your family a thing if they'll let me preach the gospel. Won't charge them a thing. Is that a good deal? It ought to be. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For even as the body is one, see, it's not many. The body is never many. Membership of the body is many, but the body is always what? Always what? One. The memberships are many. Members are many. But how many bodies? One. Uh, We make, we make great confusions about something that's really simple. Even as the body is one, yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one, 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 one body. How many bodies? One. one. I ought to be able to go to that no matter what they call themselves. If they call themselves Catholic, I ought to go there and find these seven doctrines. If I go to the Presbyterians, I should go. I should find these seven doctrines. If I go to, I should be, if I go, but, uh, yeah, uh, bleh, bleh. you understand? Just saying. This is what Paul believed. Just saying. Here is 1 Corinthians 12, 13. How do we all become a member of the one body? Here's what he says. Here's how membership works. Every church member has the same spiritual baptism into the one body as members. By one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. You got that? Whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we were all made to drink of the same Holy Spirit. The moment we believe the gospel of Christ, the Holy Spirit baptized us into the body of Christ. Your membership is in a book recorded in heaven. Uh, no matter where it's recorded anywhere else. If it's not recorded there, it ain't worth the paper it's written on down here. Not worth the paper it's written on. Well, I belong to a church. Have you ever been born again? Do you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead? I don't care what church you belong to. The only church that matters is the church of Jesus Christ. 
your name written in the Lamb's book of life with the blood of Christ. That's what counts. When you get there one day, if you're saved, you'll be thankful for that. Because let me tell you, all that role that says, says this, if you believe that, that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and get baptized in order to be saved, or believe the gospel and walk an aisle in order to be saved, do all that and join a church in order to be saved, your name is written on the book down here and not up there. Because you're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. It is a gift, not by works. Don't anybody lie to you. Read the scriptures yourself. Don't let people lie to you. I'm not lying to you. I give you scripture. I don't give you my opinion. I give you my opinion. I, I have about <laughs> Cracker Barrel, Chick-fil-A, and Express Oil. There's no scripture for that. I'm just giving a personal opinion. Here's point three. As a member of the one universal body of Christ, every member receives at grace salvation, a, listen to me, a spiritually gifted ministry for the church. Every, every member of the universal body of Christ, when you become a member, you're assigned a specific gifted ministry for the church. Did you know that? You do if you come around here. Do you know what yours is? How is it possible that you've been here this long and don't know that? You need to come see me at Chick-fil-A. If you can't find one, I'll assign one. <laughs> Listen. A baby believer can know it because it's given it salvation, like eternal life. You have to be taught you have one. You have to know what they are, but you got one, and the rest of us need it. You have a spiritually gifted ministry. You need to go to our website and look at spiritual gifts. What is it? You know what would be terrible? For you to go through this life, never give a hoot about your spiritually gifted ministry, which is your lights out destiny with the church of Jesus Christ, and die and never have served your spiritual gift to the body of Christ. That would be pitiful. Because a lot of your rewards and stuff that's going to go on at the judgment seat of Christ is going to be attached to it. A lot of it. A lot of it's going to be attached to the exercise of your gift. A lot of it's going to be exercised through your spiritual growth and your, your grace production. Yeah, you need to read 1 Corinthians 3. So here's what he says. Look, I put down four passages about spiritual gifts. You are, you are without excuse not to read them. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27 talks about gifts in the body. Uh, Romans, the 12th chapter, 3 through 8, talks about gifts in the body of Christ. Uh, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 talks about how the gifts edify the body of Christ. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 talk about how there are service gifts and speaking gifts. We call them communications. Now watch this. Watch Romans 12, 5 and 6. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individual members one another since, since, since we have gifts that differ according to what? Grace. You got it by grace. It functions by grace. It's rewarded by grace. Come on. Look. Jeez. I was talking with somebody the other day who was all excited about having tongues. Listen, I said one thing, because 
I know this. I said to him, who taught you? And he told me who. I said, that's a living proof you didn't get a gift. You did not get the gift of tongues because the gift of tongues, you don't work for it. It's grace-oriented. I gave him the passage. I'm just saying. I'm not saying you didn't experience something. I'm saying you didn't have tongues because tongues don't come by works. They come by grace. How about that? How about that? Gifts that differ, but not in this respect. They're all given by grace. They all function by grace. They're rewarded by grace. Why is it we don't study the Bible? Why is it we don't study the Bible? So, Paul says, although we are many members, we're all part of the one body. And that one body has seven key doctrines, and I'm dealing with the first one. My final point. Oh, I like this one, Ephesians 4, 16. The proper working of each individual part, that is, being gift-oriented and knowing that the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit works the gift, causes the growth edification, causes the growth of the body for the building of itself up in love. How about that? How about that? You see why your, your gift is important to us? Because it edifies the body and pushes it towards the growth in love. The exercise of the gift one among another. Oh, you ought to read that in 1 Corinthians 12 when Paul talks about, let me close. Oh, boy. During the church age, members of the one universal body of Christ are present in heaven as well on earth as well as on earth. 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, 6 through 8 says, to be absent from the body, Christians, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When the rapture comes, it says, and those who are, well, I wrote it, listen to this, very, at the very bottom of your paper, then we who are alive and remain, church age believers, will be caught up together with them, church age believers who died are in heaven, we who are on earth will be reunited right there in what's called the rapture. In the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always, shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. All right, there we are. The first of seven foundational doctrines of the church that make us universally acceptable this is the church of Jesus Christ. The first one is the body with four points under our belt. 